we're going to be going over free trade. And I think it's important to uh, go over free trade, especially at this point in time because of what's happening with the Japanese. Uh, I don't know if you people have been aware of this or not, but there's a Buy America crusade now going on in the US. There are uh, companies offering bonuses to workers who buy American automobiles. There are uh, gas stations offering a, a special deal to, uh, on gas prices if you come in with an automobile that's made in America. Um, municipalities, cities, and states are engaging in bi-local uh, activities, especially if it's something that is made in Japan, they're against it. Um, there is even a lawmaker who suggests that if there are any layoffs necessary in the state university system of Florida, that the professors who should be fired are the ones with foreign cars. Now, I take personal insult with this because I just bought a Toyota, and I'm in trouble if they apply that here. But I'm opposed to this not only on a personal basis, but on an uh, economic philosophical basis as well. Uh, one of the problems that I have with this, and, and this includes, uh, there are stores opening now that, that they say that they only sell stuff in, in the US and they have American flags all over the place. It's really disgusting. One of the things that I have against this is the uh, sheer racism. You know, there's Japan bashing, the yellow menace, uh, slammed eyed people and all that. It's very dangerous. It's got all sorts of negative repercussions. There are even cases on record where, um, what was it, some automobile workers in uh, Detroit killed a Chinese person on the grounds that he was Japanese. They couldn't tell the difference. They took baseball bats and just killed them uh, because they're against Japanese automobile incursions into this country. And this, I suggest, could just be the tip of the iceberg. Imagine if instead of Japan, uh, having a so-called favorable balance of payments with the U.S. It was a black country, such as Nigeria. And people started attacking, you know, blacks or whatever, the black menace instead of the yellow menace. Well, then it would be seen clearly as the racism that it is. Now it's uh, somehow not because Japanese people, or Japanese Americans, are not at the bottom of the economic totem pole here. But still, it's as racist as if it were attacking blacks or women or Jews or whoever. Uh, I'm not in favor of political correctitude, but you know, I wonder where are the politically correct people now that we need them on this uh, Japanese thing. They've been uh, strangely silent. What I'm going to do is speak about the case for free trade in general, and specifically I'm going to speak about the U.S.-Canada free trade agreement, that is the political uh, economic debate that took place in Canada uh, about two years ago. Why do I want to do this? Well. One is to get you out of your mindset of thinking as U.S. citizens or Americans. Uh, another is that it's, uh, Canada is a country close to us, and we can perhaps try to put our minds into them uh, thinking in terms as if we were Canadian, because Canada to the U.S. is similar to U.S. to Japan. The Japanese is seen by Americans as evil and uh, an abomination. Well, in Canada, the U.S. is seen in that role. So it will be a bit of a role reversal for you. This debate over the free trade agreement between the U.S. and Canada wasn't very important in the U.S. People in the U.S. hardly even know that Canada exists. But in Canada, this uh, debate was just tremendous, uh, tremendous importance. The entire last election was fought over little else than this, uh, this debate. Uh, this is typical because Canadians know a lot more about Americans than Americans do about Canada. As you may know, I spent the last 12 years of my life in Canada. But when I first moved, I didn't know I, I uh, lived in Vancouver, which is near Seattle. I thought it was near Buffalo. Uh, and you know, a reasonably intelligent person to miss that. And it's not just me. What I did after moving there is I wrote to friends saying, well, now I'm in Canada, in Vancouver. Do you know of any people I can interact with? And they gave me addresses in Toronto and Quebec, which is near Buffalo. You know, so it's like 2,000 miles away. Most people you know, think in terms of Canada, in terms of igloos and dog sleds, and the reality is very different. So I thought this would be a very good uh, case in point example uh, to look at free trade. The uh, way I'm going to address it is, is through this book, which is called Canada is Not for Sale, The Case Against Free Trade. Is that, is that good now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the 
bottom part reads, why you may lose your job, how the quality of your life will deteriorate, why you may lose your cultural heritage, and how Canada may it disappear as a country if Brian Mulroney has his way. Brian Mulroney was running for Premier, Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, and it's lucky that uh, for the forces of free trade in Canada that uh, the bifurcation was as follows. Brian Mulroney and the progressive conservative government was for free trade. The Liberals and the NDP, the New Democratic Party, those, there are three major parties, those are the three major parties in Canada. Two of them were against free trade. More Canadians voted against free trade than for free trade, that is more Canadians voted for the Liberals and the NDP than for the Conservatives. However, the anti-free trade forces were spread out over these two parties. They split them in half, roughly. Uh, say with roughly 30% of the vote, and the Conservatives got 40% of the vote. So they got a majority government because of the way the political situation is shaping up in Canada. So 60% of the people roughly voted against it, and yet we got it, which is another problem with the political system uh, compared to the economic system. What is free trade? Trade, as we all know, is I give you something, you give me something. We've gone over this case where I take my tie and I want to trade it for your pen, and I think that's readily understandable. If we engage in trade, then we both benefit, and that's the, the bottom line of trade. I uh, see your pen is more valuable than my tie, so I'm getting a valuable pen and giving up a lousy tie. No comments about my tie here. <laughs> You, on the other hand, weirdos that you are, think that the tie is better than the pen. So you gain in the ex ante sense of anticipations because you get the more valuable thing by losing the less valuable thing. You gain the difference to you between these two things. I gain the difference to me between these two things. It's just that we rank them in inverse order. That's why we both benefit from trade. Contrary to many people, uh, trade is not a, a loss situation. It's a a positive sum game where all parties who take part in trade benefit. I would expand it to say that all parties who engage in the market benefit because the market is just trades, just individual trades. By the way, even though I seem to be lecturing at you as, as opposed to my usual sort of a give and take, if you have questions or problems, uh, please feel free to pipe up. Free trade means that government makes no laws of bridging or prohibiting trade people are treated as an adult, not as a kid. <clears throat> what I have in mind when I'm favoring the case for free trade is the typical commercial goods and services, you know, like lima beans or TV sets, not military secrets or selling computers to, um, who's that? I used, in my lecture notes, I have the Soviets, but I can't use them anymore. Who was the guy that had the mother of all wars? The Middle Eastern guy? Hussein, right, so I have to use Hussein now because he can't use the Soviets anymore. So I'm not talking about computers or selling atomic secrets to Hussein. I'm not talking about military secrets. I'm not talking about drugs or pornography or prostitution. Those items have different implications. I'm just talking about the ordinary, you know, chairs and books and sweaters and pens and ties and things like that. And in my view, the case for free trade can... Uh, be made in two parts. One is the moral, one is the economic. I'll spend just a few minutes on the moral because most of it will be on the economics, which is, I suppose, appropriate since this is a class in economics. But yet I think we ignore the moral dimension at our peril. And the moral dimension of free trade is an important part. I think there's a human right to engage in commerce. I think that trade rights uh, are part and parcel of property rights. They're a basic building block of the free society. There was this philosopher, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who uh, went through the following example. He says, look, I'll give you this car. See, it? it's parked on the street there. I'll give it to you, but under two conditions. One, you don't sell it. And two, you don't prevent the previous owners from doing with it whatever they want. Well, in what sense can you be said to own that car if you can't sell it and you can't tell the previous owner not to use it anymore? You want to use it. The point is you don't really own it if you can't sell it or use it. Well, if you can't sell it, if you can't trade it, to that extent, your property rights over it are abridged. Not entirely, but, but to a big, big part. 
And since I think that property rights are a human right, the right to own property, uh, trade or prohibitions of trade are an abridgment of property rights and therefore an abridgment of human rights. Another moral reason for favoring free trade is peace. Historically, countries either trade or they fight. They rarely do both. Rarely has there been war between trading partners because when you're commercially intertangled with another country, there are all sorts of um, vested interests against fighting. Uh, integrated economies, uh, fighting is the exception, not the rule. So if we want peace and we want prosperity and we want human rights, that would pretty much be the moral case in favor of um, a free trade. But the economic case, I think, is more appropriate for this uh, class. Uh, and as we've said, that you benefit utility-wise in the ex ante sense as opposed to the ex post sense from trade. You might later regret the trade of the tie and the pen, but at least in the anticipation sense, that's the reason you engage in the trade. I mean, there's nothing perfect. I might get your uh, pen and, and say, oh, what a lousy pen it is, the tie was better, and vice versa for you. But still, the motivating force and the presumption is that trade benefits both parties. Can trade harm people? Can an offer to trade harm somebody? I say no. Let me take a, a possible objection uh, as a case and example. Suppose I offer a penny for your house. Now your house is worth lots more than a penny. I don't care where you live, even in a chicken coop, it's worth more than a penny. Have I harmed you by only offering a penny? It might have insulted you, but you don't have to accept that you're free to reject the penny. If you accept my monetary offer for your house, it must mean that the money I offered you is worth more than the house or whatever it is you're giving up. Therefore, you benefit. We can deduce this. I therefore say there is no such thing as a hostile takeover in the market. I mean, there are hostile takeovers. I come at you with a gun and I say, look, I'm taking over your wallet. Give it to me. That's a hostile takeover. But that's not part of the market. That's just theft. In the case of trade or takeovers, if I take over your house, it's not hostile to you because I'm paying you uh, 50000 and you decide that 50000 is worth more to you than your house. So there's no hostile takeover. Now, it might, it might be that your neighbor doesn't like me. He says, oh, boy, Block is moving in. He's going to ruin the neighborhood. So it might be hostile in his view or her view. But between the two trading partners, there cannot be any hostility. Let me give you the next cartoon here to illustrate that point. This is one of the best cartoons in the book. What, what it says is a big fat kid who is labeled USA and a little skinny kid with a, uh, a label of Canada that's a maple leaf on his sweater. And the little Canadian kid says, I got two marbles, what do you got? He wants to trade. And the big fat U.S. kid sort of bops him over the head and says, I got two marbles. Well, that's the view of trade of, um, of uh, people who are opposing free trade. What they think of free trade is that it's grabbing, it's stealing. But I appeal to your sense of logic and common sense. It isn't. Trade must be voluntary between both parties, otherwise it's not trade. It's theft. What that is, is just expropriation. One kid, the big fat one, grabs the little skinny kid's marbles and, but what that has to do with trade, I can't <coughs> understand. I think it has nothing to do with trade. It's a perversion of trade. Now let's consider the uh, objection that was on the first cartoon that uh, Canada is not for sale. Somehow it's awful if Canada is for sale. You can put it in your own terms, is the US for sale. Wouldn't it be awful if we sold the U.S. to Japan and they ran it. That's the objection. Well, in my view, it wouldn't be because we would only sell the U.S. to Japan if we got a price that made it worth it to us. For example, if they, uh, well, let's take an example. What could we get for the entire U.S. that would make it worthwhile to give up the entire U.S.? Well, if we got all of Africa, Asia, Europe, Japan, rest of the world, that might be better for us. <laughs> Instead of being confined to you know, an acre or two or three or ten, we could have 10,000 acres each. We'd be fabulously rich. Well, what's true on the macro level is true on the micro level at all, as well. 
uh, whether it's U.S. or Canada for sale on the macro level. Now let's take a little bit of the U.S. Suppose it's your house. And suppose the best opportunity for your house is 50,000 bucks. And some Japanese person comes along and says, I'll give you 100,000. Are you willing to sell you a little bit of the U.S.? Sure. It's a great deal. We can't possibly lose. Um, the only objection to this is if we think that you're really stupid. It's paternalism. In other words, if we have the idea that you're just a dummy and you don't know what your house is worth and you're going to sell it to the Japanese for a price way below its value, that's the only possible objection to the claim that we would benefit if we sold the U.S. or Canada on a voluntary basis. Now, obviously, no one's going to offer us enough to buy the U.S., so it's just a sort of a hypothetical example. But it, the objection shows that this paternalism is profoundly undemocratic. Because if we can't trust you, you little slob, to sell your house at, a, at an appropriate price, how can we trust you to vote? And on the other hand, if we can't trust you to vote, you're a citizen, then surely we can trust you to decide whether any particular deal is good or not in your, in your interest or not. Let me run another cartoon at you. Here is a picture. Uh, you can see it's a little bit dated. Uh, Ronald Reagan was president then. And Brian Mulroney has got one of the biggest chins in, in the history of civilization. I mean, it sort of sticks out to here. It's just a tremendous, immense chin. So whenever he's depicted by cartoonists, it's with a gigantic chin. So here's another way of, of uh, articulating free trade. Ronald Reagan is uh, eating the free trade turkey. And Brian Mulroney is like a little doggy. He's labeled Canada. And he's going, arf, arf, pant, pant, you know, give me a few crumbs off the table. Again, it's very similar to the, the two little boys, or the big fat boy and the little skinny boy with the marbles. It's a perversion of what free trade is. Another objection is that we'd be tenants in our own houses if we had free trade. This is a variant of don't sell Canada. But what's wrong with being tenants? Suppose you think that your house is worth $50,000, and I say I'll give you uh, 100000 and I buy it, and then I turn around and say, hey, by the way, I have no use for this house, so I'd like to rent it to you. And now you're a tenant in your own house. But you've got lots of money in the bank that you didn't have before. You could buy two or three other houses if I give you enough money. Do you get the point? There's nothing yes. Chris, um, on a larger level, let's say it, there's been complaints against some of the Japanese firms who've come in that, um, that they set up shop here, they buy American buildings, I don't know, and they start an industry and the problem is that they is that they hire their own people and that they're controlled by Japanese and that they don't, unlike American firms who go to other countries, we tend to integrate our, our uh, firms, whereas there's arguments that they, they don't do that. And that. They sort of deal just with each other and they're creating sort of their own network. Well, I don't think it's true. I think it's very expensive to get Japanese over here. Typically, what would happen is they'd get a few Japanese executives, and they'd buy a car plant. And they wouldn't fire them. You know, they wouldn't bring in 3,000 Japanese workers. What they'd do is bring in 30 Japanese executives, fire all the American uh, executives who are, in many cases, overpaid and very inefficient compared to them, and they'd run it a lot better. So there'd be 30 unemployed uh, executives. But I would say even if they fired all 3,000 and started producing it, uh, you know, it would still be in our benefit, uh, in our interest. But I'm not going to be able to show that to you until I get about 10 minutes further into the lecture when I talk about bananas. So when I get to the banana industry, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer your question, OK? Take it on faith for a few minutes. Well, maybe I'm up to that now. The next point is that in order to see the benefits of trade more clearly, let's assume that there was no trade. Let's assume that some maniac, uh, uh, Gephardt used to be running for Senate on this basis, but Clinton now is running, and uh, he seems to be running on an anti-Japanese uh, plank. Let's suppose that Clinton got in, and he was really tough, none of these wimpish uh, things, and he had the death penalty for trade, and nobody traded. Um, this would mean self-sufficiency, economic self-sufficiency. And many people are in favor of economic self-sufficiency. But if we really took this to its logical conclusion of self-sufficiency, what it would do is make sure that we had no specialization, no division of labor, and no um, uh, specializations and skills. 
we could not cooperate with the Japanese or with anyone else. A better way to see it is if instead of thinking of the whole country, we think of it in terms of the individual. In other words, if trade is bad, why should it just be that international trade is bad? Why not trade between states, Massachusetts and Connecticut, for example, or cities? Why should Worcester trade with Boston? Should we allow those Bostonians to come in here and buy our things and maybe fire us local Worcesterians? No. And we can even take it down to the individual level. Why not have individuals be self-sufficient? Not trade with anyone, because God forbid they could do something we could do. Well, if we did that, probably 98 or 99 percent of the entire population of the Earth would die, because we are all dependent for productivity for our lives, and our lives and our productivity depends upon specialization and trade. See, these things all work together. If you can't have trade, there's no sense in having specialization. Why should I produce 10,000 shoes? I only need two or three pairs of shoes or sneakers or what have you. To produce 10,000 is ludicrous. Right? Unless I can trade it, there's no reason for me to do it. But the only way I'm going to get good at it is to produce 10,000 of them. That's the only way I'm going to get uh, the, the benefits of scale, the economies of scale. If I have to produce two or three pairs of shoes for myself, and I have to produce my own food, and I have to produce my own um, Mozart symphonies, and I have to produce my own medical services, because you can't go to a doctor, that's trading medical services for money, well, I'm going to be a pretty poor boy. I'm going to be pretty inefficient because I can't possibly be skilled at all of these things. I'm going to be pretty lousy about everything. So my standard of living will plummet. So will yours because you're in the same position. We'll all be miserably poor. This earth, which can now support six, seven billion people, probably will be able to support six or seven million, which means that you know 98% of the people will die. So we really depend for our very lives on free trade or on trade. And the more of it, the better. And this attack on it is really an attack on, on life itself. The next cartoon shows, again, how the anti-free traders see free trade. Free trade is a big apple, and we have, who is it that shoots apples at somebody? William Tell? William, William Tell, right. Yeah. And uh, naturally, it's a very dangerous thing. You, know, you stick a little apple on your head, you say, okay, shoot an arrow, and you know, if he misses, you're in trouble. It goes right up your nose, and then what? So the way these people see free trade is that it's a very dangerous thing. It's a kid <coughs> standing there with an apple on your head, and probably they should have made the apple smaller to drive home the point. A little teeny apple and a, and a big beaver. Beaver is the uh, Canadian symbol, just like the uh, eagle is the US symbol. So it's a very dangerous thing to be involved in free trade in, in the view of these people. This was the vision of, um, of Adam Smith and the classical liberals, that uh, if economic self-sufficiency is, is good for, for the US, then it's good for Massachusetts. If it's good for Massachusetts, it's good for Worcester. If it's good for Worcester, it's good for Elm Street. And if it's good for Elm Street, it's good for you who live on Elm Street. But the point of the, the matter is that, is that it's not good for any of these people. Uh, Self-sufficiency sounds good. Oh, you're self-sufficient, you're noble, you're able to take on all jobs. Well, maybe it'll go over well if you don't think about it in a movie or something. But if you think about it carefully, self-sufficiency is, is like a death penalty for the masses of people. The next cartoon also illustrates free trade in a very negative uh, way. The caption reads, it's a little small for you to read, so I'll say it to you. The, uh, the US Senate, the big fat guy is uh, talking, and he's got a cigar, and he's got lots of money, and he's got lots of cards. And the little guy in, uh, with the um, maple leaf on his hat is Canada. And the big fat slob from the US says, the game is called five card free trade poker. Everything is wild, six card draw. It's my deal, my cards, my rules, my game, and we play with your money. Another way of depicting it. Okay, what I'd like to do now is to get into a bit of economic theory. And here's where we get into the bananas. What I'm going to try first to do is to illustrate the law of absolute advantage. 
And what I've got here is a situation with two countries and two goods, Canada and Costa Rica. And we've got bananas and maple syrup. And I'm assuming that a unit of bananas is worth the same as a unit of maple syrup, whether it's a pan of bananas and a quart of maple syrup, or whatever it is that equates the two. And if we have uh, two person days, or two man hours, or whatever it is, or women hours, uh, and we're going, each country is going to devote one day to one product and the other day to the other product. So, if Canada produces bananas, we're so inefficient in Canada in banana production. By the way, we could produce bananas in Canada even though there's a lot of igloos and ice. How could we produce bananas in Canada? Can anyone? Yeah. Sorry? Greenhouses. Greenhouses, or hothouses, right. It's very expensive because you have to first build a, a hothouse or a greenhouse. Maple syrup can be done easily in Canada, which shows that for a day's work, you can produce 10,000 units of maple syrup and only five bananas. Costa Rica things are inverted. There they can produce 15,000 units of bananas per day, but only 20 units of maple syrup. By the way, how could they produce maple syrup in Costa Rica, which is very hot? And you need coal for a maple tree. Well, the idea that I had was gigantic refrigerators. A refrigerator 100 feet tall, and you stick a tree in it, and that's how you do it. I mean, it'd be very expensive. It'd take a lot of electricity to keep that tree cool, but you could do it. There'd be no purpose in it, unless you were really fanatically opposed to free trade, but you could do it. So, if there's no trade, how many bananas are produced? Well, 15,005, you just add up down the, the column. How many units of maple syrup are produced? 10,020. What is world production? The world now consists of Canada and Costa Rica. It's, you add up 15,005 and 10,020, and you get 25,025. Uh, the 10,005 is Canadian national income, or GNP, and the 15,020 is Costa Rican GNP. So that's the no trade scenario. That's the top three lines. But if we have trade, what will happen is instead of Costa Rica spending one day efficiently producing 15,000 bananas and the other day very inefficiently producing 20 bananas, they'll spend both days producing bananas and they'll get a total of 30,000 bananas. Right? You, you all see that? On the other hand, Canada, or the northern country, instead of uh, spending one day reasonably well producing 10,000 units of maple syrup and the other day just wasting on 20 units of, of uh, or five units of bananas, uh, they'll spend both days on maple syrup production and they'll be able to produce 20,000 in the two days. That's the bottom uh, row. And if you add up the 20 and the 50,000, you get 50,000. So GNP for the world practically doubles. It just slightly less than doubles. It goes up from 25,025 units to 50,000 units. And presumably, this shows that there are benefits to free trade. I mean, isn't it stupid for both countries to produce both goods? Isn't it more sensible for each of them to specialize in what it does best and then trade? They'll be much richer, right? At least that's the way it makes sense to me. Well, this is absolute advantage, and I think it, it uh, very clearly shows that there are benefits to free trade. Now, to answer Chris's question, but what about the Canadian banana manufacturers? or well, the Costa Rican maple syrup manufacturers, if we have free trade, won't they lose out? And the answer is yes, they will lose out. There will be a personal tragedy in the Canadian banana industry. And here's where we get to your case where there's this uh, factory in Tennessee that's producing cars. Well, that's producing bananas. In other words, if they're producing it in such a way that the Japanese can afford to buy them out, they're not producing what they should be or how they should be. Uh, they're, they're not, it's the equivalent to the banana industry in the northern country or the maple syrup industry in the southern country. Yes, it's a personal tragedy. I told you the other day about this friend's father who was an engineer and he became technologically unemployed. Well, there will be people, and these are personal tragedies, I'm not trying to deprecate that, who will lose out. But that's economic progress. I mean, when Henry Ford came in with the, the automobile and uh, thousands of people who you find in the Western movies who were good um, 
horse breakers and horse trainers and bridle makers and carriage makers, they all went like that, economically speaking. But that's progress. If we didn't have that, we'd still be back in the horse and buggy days. And, and not only the horse and buggy days, but how about the wheel? Do you know how many people got unemployed by the wheel? All those people who were carrying stuff on their backs? Jillions of them. So, I mean, if you look at it that way, we'd be back to the Stone Age. Or before that, because, you know, why should we have the wheel? Why should we have fire? It just makes life easier. We would want that, wouldn't we? No. Okay. This is the risk that all investors in the market take. Uh, their products are no longer needed. Uh, previously, they earned profit by satisfying consumers, but now things change, and uh, uh, they can no longer do so. But am I not caught in a contradiction? Didn't I just get through saying that the market benefits all participants, and now what about all these banana people? The way I squirm out of this attempt to capture me in a contradiction is as follows. The market consists of voluntary trades. At one time, the horse and buggy industry was part of the market. Henry Ford came along, and they weren't part of the market anymore because nobody wanted their bloody horses and buggies, or very few people did. So they're not part of the market anymore. So I can still claim that the market benefits all participants, but now I have to concede that some people need not be part of the market. Canadian banana manufacturers, Costa Rican maple syrup producers, the people that made the Etzel, the people in the horse and buggy industry, the people that had mom and pop restaurants before the advent of Burger King and McDonald's and Wendy's and Pizza Hut and all those people who went broke. But that's the way we improve our standard of living. The consumer is supreme in our society. The consumer gives a thumb up or a thumbs down. And uh, woe betide the producer who doesn't uh, get in line with what the consumer wants. What about poor workers? Now, here's another point that I went over briefly, but let me reiterate. Uh, remember, I, I distinguished between general training and specific training? And I said that general training is that sort of training or skills that is useful in pretty much anything, whereas specific training is specific to the industry itself. Now, okay, let's get back to the Canadian banana manufacturers. What I want to say is that the people with general training, namely the guy that sweeps out the, uh, the hothouse, he can get a job pretty easily sweeping out the, the maple syrup place where they refine the maple syrup. He doesn't really lose. He just gets out of bananas and in maple syrup. The people that really lose are the people with specific training specific to banana production, namely hothouse engineers or banana theorists or biologists of bananas or something if they distinguish between the, the two goods. But these people are much more likely to be rich. The more training you have, the more likely it is to be specific, and the more specific and or training you have, the richer you are. Well, these are entrepreneurs. Only instead of investing in physical goods, they're investing in themselves. And their investment, you know, came unglued. But they're the rich people. So if you're worried about the poor people in free trade, worry no more, or at least worry a lot less than you were worrying before, because the poor people are less likely to lose out from a, a loss of a Canadian banana industry than the rich. And similarly with the horse and buggy industry. The guy that swept out the stables can sweep out the automobile manufacturing plant without any loss of anything. The guy who, or the, the woman or the person who was in charge of uh, a highly skilled uh, bronco busting, that skill doesn't translate too easily into automobiles. The next cartoon, that wasn't a cartoon. If you're paying attention, you've noticed that. Yes, question. Oh, sorry, Brian. So, like, ideally, if you were uh, engaged in free trade, like the President of the United States, rather than being judged a good president by, I don't know, like unemployment statistics, would he all of a sudden now be, like, judged by uh, the fact that, you know, milk and sweaters, the consumer can now buy them so much for so much less of a price? Is yeah. Oh, yes. I would judge George Bush not by barfing on the, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Japan <laughs> in order to get him to buy more of these lousy rotten cars, you know. Uh, I would judge him on free trade. I would say the more free trade he's for, the more I'm in favor of. Uh, very much so, because free trade means we can get those Toyotas and Hondas and VCRs and, and Nintendos for a lot cheaper than other ones. The next cartoon is uh, one of my favorites. 
Now that's Brian Mulroney, remember, with a big chin. And you notice that he's sort of bending down like this, so you can sort of, and he's got his lips puckered up. I have to explain this stuff to you. <laughs> and guess who he's kissing? Uh, and the caption reads, Canada, America, just like cousins, kissing cousins. And obviously, he's kissing Reagan's backside, because that's what free trade is. It puts one person over the other. One person is superior, the other person is inferior, in the view of these anti-free traders. Needless to say, I think that's nonsense, but that's the way they uh, characterize free trade. But it's got a certain charm. you know. <laughs> I have to admire it, even though I don't agree with it. OK, the objection to the um, absolute advantage case is all right, OK, wise guy. It's well and good if you know we're better at one thing and they're better at the other thing. Yes, I concede, maybe reluctantly, but I concede. Yes, it's not such a great idea. It, it is a good idea to have free trade. Because we'll specialize in what we do best, they'll specialize in what they do best, and we'll trade. And for every job loss in the Canadian banana industry, we'll get one in maple syrup. OK, no big deal, no problem, right? But, and here's the, the super objection of the protectionists, Suppose the other country is better at both things than we are. Would that uh, be a bad situation? Well, here is the situation. And the answer to that is the law of comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. And here is a uh, very simplistic, but I think uh, reasonable way to depict the, the comparative advantage doctrine. Now, we have Canada and Japan two countries, and now I'm assuming that not only is uh, Japan better than Canada in producing one good, namely TV sets, which is reasonable, but they're better at producing the other good also, wheat. So notice, again, we have this two-person day scenario, where each country has two days, and they can produce either one or the other, or both, half day or one day each. They can put two days in one, two days in the other, or one day in each. Well, let's take the one day each scenario first. If Canada produces wheat, it can produce 35 units of wheat. If it produces a TV, it can produce three. Japan is much better. It's twice as good as Canada in wheat. It can produce 70. But Japan is 33 and a third times more productive than TV sets. It can produce 100, uh, while the Canadians can only produce three. So again, we go through the same scenario. If there's no trade, then total wheat production is 105. If there's no trade, then total TV production is 103. World production is 208. Canada's GNP is 38. 35 wheat plus three TVs is 38. Japan's wheat is 70 plus 100 or 170. But if there is trade, then what happens is that each will specialize in what it has as its comparative advantage. Now remember, Japan has got an absolute advantage in both. But Japan does not have a comparative advantage in both. Rather, Japan has a comparative advantage in TVs. This is 33 times better than we are, we Canadians, in TVs, but it's only twice as good as wheat. So they have a comparative advantage in TV sets. We have a comparative advantage in wheat, because while we're only 3% as effective as the Japanese in TV, we're full 50% as effective in wheat. So notice what happens when we trade. Now Canada, instead of spending one day doing 100 TVs and another day wasted on 70 wheats, does two days at 100 for a grand total of 200. That's the bottom line. And we in Canada, instead of spending um, a good 35 uh, wheat production day in wheat and wasting our time with TVs, we spend both of our days in wheat and we produce 70. <coughs> and now world trade, or rather world GNP, rises from 208 to 270. Notice that the world is richer. The world now consists of Canada and Japan. And out of that extra 62 units comes the benefit to both parties. So again, even if one country is better than the other in both things, it still does not follow that, that, um, that uh, trade should be stopped. You see, this is the, the nightmare of the protectionists. 
the way they envision it, they say, well, my God, you know, it's okay if we're better at one thing and they're better at the other, but if they're better than us at both, what will happen is they'll start producing both and we'll go broke in both. And, and we'll end up, we'll all be on welfare, only there'll be no money for welfare because the Japanese won't give it to us. Oh, wait, I just got to check your name. I know you're the birthday boy, but... Um, <laughs> Sean, that's it. Gotcha. What happens when Japan has the entire TV market and now they move into wheat? Because they can, you know, they've... Well, you see, the thing is they wouldn't market. move into wheat. Uh, Why not? The, well, the reason they wouldn't move into wheat is because they would lose. Let me give you another example. Uh, another numerical, a different numerical example to try to answer that. I figure if one doesn't get you, the other one will. This example shows a lawyer and a typist. And the lawyer, wait, I, I had to rearrange my notes because you took me out of order. Here we go. The lawyer can make a thousand a day. The typist can make 150 a day. Okay. Now remember, you're asking why doesn't Canada, why doesn't Japan do both? Well, I'm translating into why doesn't the lawyer do both? But let me explain further. If there is trade, what happens is that the lawyer can work two days as a lawyer and he can make two thousand dollars, and the typist can work two days as a typist and make three hundred. So. Total GNP between the two of them is 1700 If there's no trade, just looking at it from the lawyer's point of view, one day he or she spends as a lawyer making 1000 and the other day is spent making just 150 for a grand total of 1150 Right? You, you see, if the lawyer trades, he or she will make 2000 make 1000 a day. I should have had a, a third category for that. His or her, the lawyer's fee is 2000 if he trades. If he doesn't trade, he only makes 1150 So to answer your question is, he's got the, the lawyer market covered. Why doesn't he branch into uh, TV uh, wheat production? Or why doesn't he branch into typist? Because he'll lose money. He can make more by specializing in the thing that he's got a comparative advantage in. Sean? But if he's such a good lawyer, he gets done by 3 o'clock with all his law work. He can send the typist home. He doesn't have to pay her. He can do the typing. Oh, I see. And now he's into the typing market. Yeah, well, I'm assuming that there's plenty of lawyer work for him, and I'm assuming that there are plenty of TVs to be made. Okay. Now, remember that list I, I went over last time? I don't know if I did it in this class. Yeah. I did. See, what you're assuming is we've got to the bottom of our list. There's no more need for TVs. Right. Then he'd go into weed or something. But I'm assuming that... There are plenty of people out there that want TVs. It's just expensive to get them. Hasn't it kind of been demonstrated uh, practically that the Japanese have dominated markets like VCRs, radios, those kind of things, and now they've got another market? Yeah, other they, markets. They go into real estate. Other markets, mainly Nintendos and, and lawnmowers and things. But in terms of weed, I mean, it's just ludicrous to think of them doing weed. They've got no room in the bloody country. <laughs> I mean, Wheat takes a lot of area, and Japan is, I think, Japan is about the size of California, more or less. California's got about 25 million people. Japan is close to that size, maybe even a little smaller, and a lot of it's mountainous, and they've got about 90 million people. They're, it's scrunch city. You know, to think of them doing wheat, and the, to think of that being sensible, it, it just sort of boggles the mind. But if you if move you, away from wheat, I'm sorry. If you move away from wheat, okay, so we have the agrarian market all of ourselves. But you see, if you push me that way, then I have to get a third good, because you know I'm willing to concede that yes, they have a, a comparative advantage in wheat and TV sets. But then there's got to be a third good. I mean, you know, these are very artificial models with only two goods. They can only illustrate so much. So if you're going to push me that far, then I have to come up with another good. I mean, they can't do everything. There's got to be something that we can do that will have a comparative advantage over them. Promise. Honestly, <laughs> I'm proud. <laughs> uh, Renee. Um, if the United States has the comparative advantage in wheat and 
say Japan did want to start producing wheat, would we still be able to produce it for less so that their market, people would still want the American wheat because it's less expensive even in Japan that they demand that import? Is that right? Like if, if we have the comparative advantage, then ours would be less expensive even if they started making it? Yes, yes, because remember you have to think of costs in terms of alternative costs. Japan's wheat is very expensive, not because they can't produce wheat, they can, twice as good as wheat, but because they do it at the cost of giving up stuff that they can produce even more. Computers or whatever, cars, lawnmowers, VCRs. See, so if you just look at it, what does it take them to produce wheat, what does it take us to produce wheat, uh, based on the other uh, diagram, I'm conceding that it, we're so inefficient that it, they can do wheat better than us. Remember, this is comparative advantage. They can do everything better than us, absolutely. But they can't do everything better than us comparatively. There have got to be some things that they're better at than others vis-a-vis -vis us. And on those things, we'll be able to do it. Let me try another one at you to see if I can't convince you in another way. Try this example. Suppose that there's a Made in Canada TV set that costs 500 bucks or made in US if you want, if you can't uh, get your minds into being Canadian. The, the TV set made in America costs 500 bucks. The Japanese are so efficient that they can produce them from $100, $400. Okay, so we open up free trade, and the first thing that happens is that there's no more US TV industry, right? We don't produce anymore. We're all knocked out of the box. We're bankrupt, belly up. But remember, we're getting the same quality TV. We'll assume they're equal quality. We're getting the same quality TV for 100 where we used to spend 500, right? What are we going to do with the extra 400 bucks? Well, maybe we'll buy five TVs. Or maybe we'll buy two TVs and three sweaters or something. Well, that'll create jobs for the unemployed TV, US TV people. What are the Japanese going to do with the hundred bucks we give them? Well, there are only three things they can do with it. They can either buy stuff here, and what are they going to buy? TVs from us? Don't be ridiculous. They'll buy wheat. And if they're too busy producing wheat too, they'll buy something else, because they got to give us that money, because the other two alternatives are way worse. The second alternative for them, what they're going to do with their hundred, is burn it. Well, if they burn it, then it's in effect a gift of a free TV. And the third thing is they can spend it in another country, say Italy. But what is Italy going to do with US dollars? They'll have to buy stuff from us, which will be wheat again. Or whatever, it doesn't matter. So no matter how you slice it, this uh, bogeyman, of the other country being more efficient than us at both things is just that, it's a bogeyman, it's a, a, a tale concocted to scare uh, unsophisticated people in economics. It's not something that we should worry about. Well, I don't you know, I still see some puzzled looks and, um, oh boy, he's full of it today. You know, usually he's a little weird, but today he's just going off the deep end. I mean, this maniac, what is he telling us? Uh, all I can say is um, read the Hazlitt chapter. I mean, this lecture or this, these notes here are an attempt to you know, help you out with the Hazlitt. I, I think that chapter is very important. And I've still got some more you know, shots in my gun here, so let me uh, go on. We go from 2 to 3.15. Okay, it's time for a cartoon. Comment relief. Here is another way of depicting U.S.-Canada um, free trade. The, the fat guy, Simon, is naked, except for a maple leaf uh, held in a uh, critical position there. And Peter Murphy is uh, the U.S. Uh, person. And I don't know if you can see it clearly, but Peter Murphy is wearing two sets of clothes. He's wearing two ties. He's wearing two suits. He's wearing two shirts. He's got two of everything. Namely, what, what the free trade deal is between Canada and the U.S. is that the U.S. took all of our clothing and we're just sort of hanging out there naked, uh, letting it all hang out. So 
certainly this is a very bad way of uh, seeing free trade. Why is it difficult for economists to make the case to non-economists of the benefits of free trade? I think it has to do with what Hazlitt says about the seen versus the unseen. We all see the jobs being lost. We all see uh, the closures of uh, automobile plants or whatever. That's obvious. It's explicit. What we don't see, the unseen, is all the jobs that are created by the extra 400 bucks that we used to spend $500 for a TV, we now only spend 100. That extra $400 creates lots of other jobs. And I don't even like saying creates jobs as if creating jobs is a good thing. Creating jobs is a bad thing. Creating production is a good thing. Creating jobs just wastes manpower, person power. It's, it's a precious thing. We don't want to just spend it frivolously. But to put it in that other lingo, what you don't see are all the other jobs created by the extra $400 that you now have in your pocket that you wouldn't have had had we been dependent upon US or Canadian TVs. And you also don't see the, the results of the $100 that the Japanese are returning to us because trade is a continual cycle. They don't just keep that 100 bucks that we bought their TV set for. They spend it here. The extra 400 gets spent here. We're a lot richer. We used to spend 500 and we just got one TV. Now we spend 100 and we got one TV. That's why we have a standard of living that is the envy of the whole world, Japan included, which is a whole other issue. The next cartoon is the, um, what is that course? Trojan horse, that's right. Trade is a Trojan horse. I mean, these are just theme and variations. Trade is bad, trade is evil, trade is disreputable, trade is no good. Well, now trade is a Trojan horse. Canada is uh, looking out at the, at the Trojan horse of free trade and they're saying, well, it looks okay to me, let it in. And then, of course, it's filled with enemy soldiers and they'll overrun the fort. So again, we see free trade on the model of battle, of conquest, of rape. But I put it to you that the very opposite is, is, the, is the truth. The reason these people see it this way is, I guess, because they have this bias against economic freedom. But the reality is that economic freedom has got to be mutually beneficial, otherwise people wouldn't engage in it. That is, for market participants. OK, now I have a whole bunch of objections um, not that I haven't taken some objections, but now for the rest of my comments, I'll just be giving objections to the free trade theory. Some of them will be in a Canadian context, and I'll have to explain the Canadian reality a bit, but most of them will be readily understandable. Brian, did you have a question? Somebody I didn't uh, get. No? Got everybody? One objection is that unless we have interferences with free trade, we won't have a level playing field. You've heard of the level playing field argument, right? Okay. Now, these analogies from sports are entirely illegitimate. Uh, sports is a zero-sum game. Every time one team scores, it scores at the expense of the other team. If I score a goal on you, I'm one up, you're one down. It's not that we're both up. The way I get up in sports is by pushing you down. In boxing, it's by knocking you down. In uh, hockey or football, it's by scoring on you. When I score on you, I push you down, I elevate myself, I'm the winner, you're the loser. In free trade, it's very different. Another analogy is the game Monopoly. Another sport analogy. You played Monopoly, you know, you land on Boardwalk or Park Place and you pay a ton of money. There, you lose. There's a winner and a loser. Monopoly is very different than an economy. An economy is a mutual cooperative venture. You know, we talk about competition, but we're really cooperating with each other. That's the essence of economics, is mutual cooperation. Monopoly, it's not mutual cooperation. Monopoly is to, you know, get the other guy, poker, you know, kill him, get him, chess. All these things where you have level playing fields are important if you want to have a good battle. I mean, 
not only does the playing field have to be level, but you have to change sides at the halftime or whatever because the sun might be in someone's eye or who knows what, or you know, maybe the aura is different if you're into crystals or whatever. So you try to equate everything in sports, and that's reasonable. Everyone wants a, a level playing field. The problem is when you try to take a, uh, a thing that's appropriate in one area and you try to import it into another where it's not appropriate, you do great damage. I think what we want in, in, the, in the area of economics is an unlevel playing field. We want somebody with a great advantage against somebody with a disadvantage. Look, to get back to the bananas and the maple syrup, in bananas, there was not a level playing field. Costa Rica had it all over Canada in terms of bananas. There was no level playing field. Any attempt to level the playing field, i.e. to make it so that it wasn't good for Canada to import bananas would have violated uh, the whole reason that et for the trade in the first place. What I'm trying to say is that while it makes sense to have a le level playing field in sports, it's only fair, in trade the very opposite is the case. What you don't want is a level playing field because if it was a level playing field, there'd be no trade. But we want trade. I hope I've convinced you, certainly in the banana maple syrup case, so any attempt to level it up, I mean, you know, Costa Rica's got a great advantage. Costa Rica's over here. They're, they're way up on bananas. So if you level it out, then there'd be no banana movement across barriers, and what good is that? So I reject the, uh, the level playing field analogy. I think it's just nonsense. The next fallacy, or the next objection, each of these objections is a fallacy because, you know, it's fallacious to object to free trade. The next one is dumping. When I first heard this one, I guess I must have been in high school, what I figured, you know, like the Japanese are dumping, no, I think it was the Germans that were dumping Volkswagens on us in those days, but I guess the Japanese can dump Hondas. And the way I pictured, I ought to get a cartoonist to draw this. The way I picture this is that this big airplane, you know, B-52, and it's got Hondas, and they sort of push the Hondas out at 50,000 feet, and it drops on people, you know, the people are running around, and worrying that they'll be dumped on, and some car will crash out on top of them. Well, I mean, if that's dumping, well, you know, I'm against dumping. You know, it's, it's violence, it's coercion, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's instead of shooting bullets at us, they're shooting cars. You know, you get hit by a car from 50,000 feet, and you're squashed. So if that's dumping, we're against that. But see, what they're doing is they're trading in on a word that, that evokes such a picture. But what they're really doing is they're saying, hey, fellas, you know, the, the cars that you're making, you know, they cost ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. We'll give you the same car for 5000 or a better one for ten or fifteen. dollars And the Americans are scurrying. Yes, yes, we want to get it. That's not dumping. Another objection is that they're, what they're doing is they're charging below cost pricing. In other words, it really costs them ten thousand to make the car, and they're selling it to us for five thousand. Well, if they're such idiots, why not take advantage of them? But then the claim is that there's this nefarious scheme. What they'll do is first they'll charge us five thousand for a ten thousand dollar car. They'll knock our production out of the box. They'll, they'll raise it to 15 pence. Chris? Isn't that, isn't that argument? Uh, I, I've heard something about that, about the Lexus. The Lexus, yeah. The, uh, I think GM was complaining they, they took the car and they tried to reassemble it. And uh, Could you take his picture while he's... Uh... <laughs> Sorry. Smile. Smile. Um, and GM... <laughs> look, look at me, but just ignore him. No, and GM tried to reassemble it, and it was worth... And I guess they're charging... 48,000 for this car, and GM said they can't make it for less than 60,000 under the best conditions. And GM's crying that, that uh, who, who makes it, Toyota, is making Lexus for, is, is being, what do they call it, Pred predatory? Predatory pricing or below cost pricing or whatever. It's not fair, and, then, right. and then people are competition. scurrying to buy the car though because it's almost as good as a Mercedes and uh, it is so much cheaper. Right. Um, Aren't those Japanese a bunch of rats? Imagine, it costs them six, now turn, <laughs> keep your eye on whoever's talking. Uh, they're a bunch of rats, they're a bunch of fakes, they're a bunch of bad guys. 
look at what they're doing. It costs them $60,000 to make this car. Now, I'm assuming that this, this is correct. I don't know. But let's suppose it is. It costs them 60000 bucks. I don't really believe it's true, because it implies that the Japanese are idiots. But let's suppose it's true. It costs them $60,000 to make this Mercedes quality car. Uh, they're selling it to us for forty-eight, so we're going in and sort of mindlessly buying these things. Well, that's sort of stupid. They lose ten, twelve thousand dollars per shot. It only makes sense if what they're going to do after they drive us out of business is make it hundred thousand dollars for a sixty thousand dollar car. There are so many problems with this, uh, one hardly knows where to begin. Now, this is the, uh, the predatory pricing model or the local price cutting model. Uh, you see, the Japanese are going to lose money hand over fist doing this. I mean, their whole fortune will be dissipated. And all GM has to do is close down temporarily, leave those factories intact. And then as soon as the Japanese raise the price to 80 or 100,000, and let's say the US can reduce it to 60, right? Well, then we go back into business. So for three years, the Japanese drive themselves crazy. They give us vast millions of dollars of treasure. And then they try to pull this fast one on us, and we say, forget it, you yellow menace. You know, we'll, we'll stop you to be racist about it. I, I think that this is just um, imbecilic. Nobody makes money by, uh, Yes, yes, there are lost leaders. You know, you go into the grocery store and they say they'll sell you a quart of milk for half price, but one to a customer. And they figure once you're in the, the place, you'll buy some other things. And that's okay. But you can't uh, do it that way. I mean, you know, if, if they were really doing it, what they should do, if you wanted to make it sensible, is they should make it like a lottery. Instead of one to a customer, well, everyone can afford one bottle of milk. You can't afford to give twelve thousand dollars one to a customer. No, you can't have a six pack of Lexuses. You can only have one. Now, that wouldn't work. Uh, what they could do is is have a lottery. They'll say, well we'll sell one sixty thousand dollar car for forty eight thousand and the lucky winner will be, you know, and that's a way of getting uh, publicity for it. But what the contention is is very different. I think the contention is completely fallacious. Um, so we, we went over dumping. Let me give you another cartoon now. Uh, you can see Uncle Sam with a top hat. And uh, the Canadian representative has got reindeer antlers on his head. Anything to make Canadians look ridiculous in dealing with the US Colossus. It's funny, like here in the US, we feel hard done by by the Japanese. We're a country of what, 270 million? They've only got 90 million? It's much more reasonable in Canada that they feel hard done by by the US. You know, the, the expression is the US sneezes and Canada catches cold. Another one is this joke where there's this elephant and a, a, a mouse, and the mouse is sitting on the elephant's back, and they walk over the bridge, and the bridge sways, and and then the mouse says to the elephant, boy, we made that bridge sway, didn't we? <laughs> Mainly the elephant. So it says here, agreed, Canada will corner the market in hand-carved Haida chess pieces and boards while the US controls oil. Oil is better than chess pieces. OK, another objection that was voiced, <laughs> well, I guess, I don't know, some jokes are funny somewhere. <laughs> yeah, be there. No, I think I'm the world's worst uh, <coughs> joke teller, but it's probably good that I try. In any case, I don't know. If you hate it, you know, you sign a petition, no more jokes, and I'll, I'll try not to. Um, political integration. Another fear of Canadians is that they'll be gobbled up, not only economically speaking, but politically speaking. Now, remember, I don't think it's possible to be gobbled up economically speaking, because trade is mutually beneficial. It's not a rape, it's not a murder, it's not a theft, it's mutuality. But the idea here was that if Canada engaged in a free trade uh, agreement with the US, then eventually Canada would become part of the US. You know, maybe three states. Canada would come in as three US states. 
Uh, my answer to that is that any time the U.S. wants to take Canada over and make it states, it can do it militarily. They don't need to engage in integration of economics. I mean, the U.S. is stronger than Canada. If it wanted to conquer Canada, you know, Canadians couldn't stop. I mean, Canada really doesn't have much of an army or an air force or a navy. I think they've got a few rowboats, and that's about it. So, you know, all they have is police. You know, the Vancouver police, the Toronto police, but they have no army worth. I mean, even the mother of all battles, Saddam Hussein probably could have conquered. Well, maybe not, because you know, we've got the technology and he didn't. But certainly, the U.S. can take over politically. So there's no reason to take over economically, even if taking over economically was a coherent uh, phrase, which it's not. But then there are other examples that show the, the case where you have economic integration without any political integration. For example, the EEC, the European Economic Community. Uh, you've had lots of big countries. You see, the fear is that the US is very big and Canada is very small. But Great Britain, France, and West Germany were, were gigantic compared to Liechtenstein, Portugal, and Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And yet, there's no political integration, it's just economic integration so far. Another example is the, um, what are those countries of North, Sweden, uh, what are they called? Scandinavian. Scandinavian countries. I don't know why I keep losing words. I guess it's. Um, brain dead or something. Sweden is much bigger than Norway and Finland, and Norway and Finland are way bigger than Iceland, and yet the Scandinavian free trade zone has been in operation for decades, and there's been no movement toward political integration. It's Alzheimer's disease, that's what I'm getting. <laughs> Look, you laugh now, but you know, at the common time, you know, not only does the, uh, the, the physical body deteriorate, but everything else does too. I would go so far as to say that there's no case in the history of the world where economic integration led to political integration. The usual way of political integration is conquest or voting, but economic integration has got little to do with it. Another one is that tariff protection can be justified on monopoly grounds. A large country can act like a monopolist or a monopsonist. A monopsonist is a single buyer, a monopolist is a single seller. This is technically correct, that there could be a case, uh, there's a specialized literature in economics that shows that on certain conditions, if the, uh, the big government or the big country acts monopolistically, and uh, with regards to the small country or countries, it can reap certain monopolistic privileges. Well, I have two objections to this. One, I don't go for the argument at all. But to go into that, I'd have to give you a whole hour's lecture on why I think that the monopoly arguments or the arguments for antitrust are wrong. I won't do that. I'll assume just for the moment that it's right that under certain technical conditions, uh, the country couldn't act like a monopolist. But still, there are, are problems with this. First of all, it's incompatible with our own antitrust law. We have an antitrust law in the United States that prohibits companies from doing this. So the argument favor of tariffs would make the government get into the monopoly business, which is certainly morally questionable. Secondly, it assumes that government can plan its way out of a paper bag, that government intervention is economically viable. Yet if we learn anything from the uh, debacle of the Soviet society, we learn that government can't really plan. It might conceivably work under the best conditions, but the reality is that there'll be log rolling and special interests, and that's the way the antitrust will work, not in behalf of these technically correct economic arguments. Now I want to give you a good cartoon. This doesn't come from the book, this is a, but it's a great cartoon. Uh, the depiction here is that this is Mr. and Mrs. Average Canadian. They watch Bill Cosby on Sony TV. Now remember, Bill Cosby is bad because he's American. We're in Canada now. And Sony is bad because it's Japanese. He eats Big Macs, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Chinese takeout. He wears Levi's and Calvin Klein's, which is US. He walks in English wallabies 
with his Siberian Husky, again, from another country than Canada. He drives a Honda. He sits on Scandinavian furniture. He drinks Bud, Coke, or Pepsi, which is from the US. And he thinks that free trade will destroy the unique Canadian identity. The next one is the infant industries argument. The infant industries argument was promulgated by, oh, what's his name, that bad guy in American history. I should have this in my notes. Who is it? That's it. <laughs> you have to poo and hiss whenever you hear the name Alexander Hamilton. He's just the evil incarnate. He was the one that was in favor of the first tariff policy in the US back in, oh, 1790 or 1805 or something like that, a little week on history. His idea was, yes, yes, the British, they were the bad guys in those days. They're much more efficient with regards to woolen goods and furniture and pianos and things like that. We Americans can't compete. But what we'll do for 20 years or so is we'll have protective tariffs, that is, not protecting the consumer in America, but rather the producer in America. And we'll let them hide behind tariff walls until they grow up out of their infancy, and then they'll be able to take on big, bad Brits. Well, these infants have a way of lasting for hundreds of years in their infancy. You know, if you let infants uh, crawl around, they never grow up. You have to eventually tell them to shape up. So that's one problem. You get textiles, you get shoes, which have been infants for hundreds of years. Now, when does this infancy end? But on a more radical level, you can object to the infant industry argument on the grounds that in the initial period, uh, the consumers lose and the manufacturers gain vast profits. Eventually, when uh, assuming that this is correct, that the infant will grow up, then he'll make profits because he's now a grown-up manufacturer. In other words, let's assume that the infant industry argument were correct. I try to say that it's not, that the infants last 100 years, but suppose it were. Suppose Alexander Hamilton just did it for 20 years and then he let them cut them adrift. But every industry, every firm, when it starts up, is an infant. That is, it loses money. You open a, an ice cream store or a hot dog stand, and before you've opened up on day one, you've already lost money. And, and you know what that's called? It's called investment. And the presumption is that in the, in the initial period you invest, you lose, and then it, later on you gain. Well, look at what the infant industry argument does. It says initially, instead of you investing, Mr. Manufacturer or Mrs. Manufacturer, we'll do the investing for you. And then when it succeeds, you keep the money. What kind of nonsense is that? That's not the free market system. The free market system is that he or she who wants to open an enterprise, they pay the investor. Alexander Hamilton is going to pay it for him with taxpayer money. So even if the infant industry argument were correct, which it's not, um, it still doesn't apply. I have a few other things that are mainly uh, Canadian. Uh, but I've only got a few minutes, so let me summarize. Oh yes, the Canadian culture. I've got to tell you about Canadian culture. See, the argument there is that if we allow free trade, then all the indigenous Canadian culture will be swamped by US culture. And what they have there is special laws, uh, Canadian content laws on TV. Canadian TV is very boring. You've either got US good shows or you've got the most boring crap imaginable that nobody wants to watch. That's the Canadian content laws. I mean, look, Canada isn't really much bigger population-wise than Ohio and Indiana. You know, it's got about 20 million people, 20, no, maybe 26 million people. To expect Canada to be a world's leading expert in everything is, is akin to expecting Ohio and Indiana and uh, Pennsylvania say to, to be a world leader in everything. Canada has some good uh, actors and um, movie stars and uh, musical artists and um, artists, but uh, not as many as would keep all Canadian con customers satisfied. Canadians want to watch uh, 
you know, Elvis Presley and Archie Bunker and uh, the Dynasty and all those TV shows that you can see my lecture notes are a little dated because I don't have <laughs> modern shows, but what can you do? Uh, another problem with this uh, cultural protectionism is that Mozart and Bach were not Canadians. They weren't even Americans. They were bloody Europeans. So if we're going to really have a cultural imperialistic policy of not allowing any culture to infect a pure Canadian version, we've got to get rid of Mozart and Bach, who I happen to like, and you know, sort of against it on that ground. Another problem is that there's no demonstration that there's any indigenous Canadian culture, because all of it is subsidized by the government. The only culture, as far as I'm concerned, that makes any sense is culture that people are willing to put cash down on the barrel head for. Canada, very little of that is done. Most of it is just, they're just welfare recipients who uh, draw pictures that nobody wants to watch. The better. <laughs> well, we're lucky we don't have it in this country, so you can sort of laugh at it. But we have we have equivalents, you know. Uh, where see, we have a, a what do they call it? Corporate welfare bums. We have companies that go down to Washington and go to Boston and get thousands or millions of dollars to do stuff that nobody wants to pay him for. In conclusion, the alternative is before us with the free trade, with this election, uh, a small step toward free trade, or we stick our head in the sand like an ostrich and we let the world go by. I think that it's a mistake to open up stores that say that they're Canadian, that they're US stores. It's a mistake for companies not to buy from Japan. It's a mistake for companies to uh, give bonuses to people that buy American cars. It's a mistake for um, gas, gasoline filling stations to make cheaper gas if you have a US car. And it's very hard to tell what a US car is nowadays anyway. Half the parts are made elsewhere. And then uh, the Hondas and Toyotas are made in this country. So it, it's just silly and imbecilic. And um, that's it on free trade. So read the Hazlitt. Brian? Not so. Ah, we're out of time. Uh, I'll see you Thursday.